I'm Elizabeth Richard. I'm the daughter of Barbara Gondé, in whose memory tonight's endowed lecture is dedicated. She was a devoted library lover and supporter of the Free Library, and my family and I couldn't have thought of a more fitting tribute to her. On behalf of all of them, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here tonight. Tonight's author event, along with so many other critical and enriching programs, is made possible only through generous private support. If you've not already done so, I hope you'll consider making a gift in helping the Free Library advance literacy, guide learning, and inspire curiosity for all Philadelphians. Tonight, we're proud to welcome Mary Louise Kelly, an NPR reporter for more than two decades. She currently co-hosts the network's flagship program, All Things Considered, the most listened to radio news show in the United States. Also the author of two very popular suspense novels, she has contributed articles and essays to a variety of publications, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Atlantic. Kelly created and taught a graduate course on national security and journalism at Georgetown University, served as a contributing editor at the Atlantic, and has moderated high profile interviews at venues around the globe in It Goes So Fast. She reflects upon life's joys, sorrows, and pivotal changes in the year leading up to her son's departure to college. I'm sure many in this audience tonight will be able to identify with her. I know I do. I have a first year in college and a junior in high school. So she will be in conversation this evening with Tracy Matisak, award-winning broadcaster and journalist herself, who is no stranger to the stage. And now, please join me in welcoming this evening. Good evening. We're delighted to have all of you here. Um, and if you have been with us before, then you know the routine. Um, we will have a conversation for 40 or 45 minutes, and we'll open it up for your questions as well. Um, if you've got a question for our speaker, then just signal to us. Um, we'll have someone with a microphone who will come and take your question. So all of that said, Mary Louise Kelly, Welcome to the Thank Free Library you. of Philadelphia. We're excited to have you. I am so excited to be here on this very warm day. I thought I was heading north and it would be a little bit cooler, but uh, <laughs> not so much. Not so so much. it's very nice to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Well, the book, of course, is called It Goes So Fast. Anyone who has raised uh, children into adulthood knows that. Of course, the subtitle is The Year of No Do-Over, so we plan to talk about that and more this evening. And Mary Louise, uh, this book feels like a bit of a departure for you because we are familiar with your work on All Things Considered. Um, you've written spy novels as well in your copious spare time. Um, but what made you decide to write something as personal as a book about family and that, um, that path that most parents feel um, toward the end of their firstborn's childhood when you feel like you've got one last chance to get it right before they leave the nest? Thank you, um, and thank you for for moderating and for um, teeing me up with a great first question. I think I started wrestling with this book in my mind before I'd put a single word down on paper um, because I was thinking about a quote from Toni Morrison, which goes as follows. If there is a book you want to read and it has not been written, then you must write it. And there was a book I wanted to read, and I couldn't tell that anybody had written it, and it had to do with my oldest, um, who was 17 and turning 18 and entering his last year of high school. So entering the last year that he was guaranteed to live at home with us under my roof, that we were all gonna be intact together as a family. Um, and the, the moment that really put a fine point on it for me as I thought about you know, the, the trade-offs and the deals that I have cut with myself as a working mother over the years was this. Um, this son, James, uh, 18, loves soccer, like loves soccer, has played it since literally before he could walk. One of my early memories is of him crawling across the floor with one of those little Nerf peewee balls and batting it and then crawling after it. Um, and his father saying, you can't use your hands, that's against the rules, red card, <laughs> think again. Um, and I'm kind of looking puzzled and then putting his head down and heading it and then crawling after it. So that's kind of where we were at age one. By the time he was 17, he was a starting striker on his high school soccer team and lived for these games and his Varsity soccer games tended to start around four o'clock on weekdays. 
And I have a conflict at four o'clock on weekdays, which is that it is the exact minute that All Things Considered goes on air. And every year I thought I'm gonna figure this out next year, I'm gonna figure out how to be there. And ninth grade slid into 10th, slid into 11th, slid into suddenly we were staring down senior year and I was out of next year's. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any more do-overs. And I really wanted to, to wrestle, as I say, with, with the deals I had cut with myself, but do it in real time. So I wrote last year in real time. Beyond being able to go to the games and, and, and do those kinds of things, was there other unfinished business that you felt that you had as a parent? Were there things that you still wanted to pour into him? Or what was sort of the unfinished business that you wanted to take care yeah. of? Yeah, I mean, I think you always are trying to teach your kid and impart the message of, you know, whatever it is that you're, you know, wondering what they are someday when their parents going to remember you taught them and thinking, did I do any of that? Like, does he remember any of this? <laughs> All the times I told him, you have to be kind, you have to be grateful, you, know, you do really need to write that thank you note. Um, but I think it was, for me, I mean, I'll use the soccer game example again, but substitute for soccer game, the you know swim meet, the pool party, the field trip, the whatever it was, um, I, in trying to wrestle career and family, have always said, look, the kids come first. If they come into conflict, the kids come first, and that's a, a bright line. And in real, you know, the really big things, the birthday parties, the camp drop-offs, I showed up. Um, but things like a four, four o'clock soccer game, when there are zillions of them right. yet to go, I was like, well, next time I will be there. And then, when I looked at the senior year schedule and realized I can count on, on my hands the number of games that are left, I, I <laughs> I'd rather cut off my right arm than miss one. And that was the, the realizing, and we know this, you know it's finite, and you know this is the whole point of the enterprise is they're gonna grow up and go out into the world. But realizing, I think I made the, the hard choices right. You know, the big black and white go do the interview, get on the plane to do a story, or be there for your kids, you know, you know serious, significant birthday or whatever it is. Like, I chose my family. Um, but there was this big gray space of all the little, little choices and little things that I'd missed. And that hit me really hard when suddenly the clock was ticking very fast till the end. There's a sentence in, early on in the book that you wrote that jumped off the page for me, and it said, Perhaps the secret to a happy life isn't about making the right choices so much as learning to live with the ones we make. And I felt like that's really what the book is about, isn't it? It's about the choices that we make as parents. It's about the trade-offs, to use the word that you just used, um, that parents and that women in particular have to make in order to both nurture our careers yeah. and nurture our families at the same time. Yeah, so I'll tell the story about that. Um, which is when my other son was two years old, he was not speaking at all. Um, like he wasn't, there was no baby talk, he had never said mama, dada, nothing, no verbalizing. Um, and I just kept thinking he'll talk when he's ready. And the pediatrician disagreed and at his two year annual checkup said, you need to intervene aggressively now. He needs speech therapy. He needs it probably several times a week. He's gonna need it for a while. He's gonna need outside of those lessons for you to be reinforcing the exercises the therapist is doing. Um, if, if the goal is mainstream school, you need to get in there right now. And I remember you know, wheel, wheeling him in his stroller back to the car and thinking, I don't have the kind of job where I have mornings to devote to speech therapy several times a week. What is, how is this gonna work? And my husband didn't either. Um, long story short, we had a conversation, and my husband and I, and I went in and told my editors I need a year off, unpaid. Um, and they said, I mean, we can't stop you, but we're not holding your job. Yeah. And I said, okay. Um, so I took a year, and we did a whole lot of speech therapy, and um, I was pushing my son in a stroller to the park one morning, and 
ran into another reporter, a competitor from another news organization who had scooped me a bunch of times. And she looked just as she always had. She's in this killer suit with great heel, you know, like high heels and hair done. And I looked like I had not, you know, changed out of faded gap jeans and an old sweatshirt and many <laughs> moons. And I was headed to the park with a bag of Cheerios and singing the Itsy Bitsy Spider as we went. And I called her name to say hi, and she did not recognize me. I looked so different. And we chatted for a few minutes, and then she put her hand up and called for a taxi and said, I have to go to the White House. I'm late for an interview. Lovely to see you. And she sped off. And I stood on the sidewalk and just, I think I felt like I didn't recognize myself in that moment. I watched her get in the taxi and knew, like, I love my son. I understand that what we are doing the two of us is important. I understand I can't delegate this, but that's the life I thought I was. That's what I was preparing for. That's what I worked so hard to do. Um, and I spent the rest of the day beating myself up. And then um, time passed. My son started talking. He did talk when he was ready. Um, I went back to the newsroom. They had not held my beat for me, but there was a new opening covering the Pentagon, and so I took over as uh, one of our Pentagon correspondents. And I ran into this woman again, and she recognized me. And we chatted for a few minutes. We're on a sidewalk. And we're both turning to go, and she said, you know, she's leaving, turned back around and said, just so you know, I cried all day after I ran into you. And I said, what? No, you had. She also had a, a toddler around the age of mine, and I said, you had everything, you had it all, you were, you were living the dream. And she said, I was stuffed into Spanx and uncomfortable heels and off to the White House to interview some official about, I can't even remember what the story was, it was not that important. And I had dropped my baby at daycare so that a stranger could take her to the park that morning. She said, I saw you and you and your son looked so happy. And I said, I thought, I thought, you know, I'd thrown my career away. And she said, you were singing. You and he were singing. And I thought, ah, oh, man, you know, we, we both, both of us were beating ourselves up for, um, for failing to do the impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't be in the White House doing your big interview and in the park with your child on a lovely morning at the same time. It ain't possible. And, um, I title, or I end that chapter by talking about how so much of life depends on what we choose to see. Exactly. Um, so most parents are familiar with that feeling of dread that comes when the school nurse calls in the middle of the day, but most parents are not on a helicopter in Baghdad when that call comes. That actually happened to you. Um, can you take us back to that day? Because you describe that as the day you hit the wall. I did hit the wall, yeah. So I had gone back and was working as Pentagon correspondent, and part of my duties involved following the Secretary of Defense on his travels and reporting on who he met and what got said and what deals get cut. And on that trip, um, we had been, I think, in Jordan, and then we had come up through um, southern Iraq and stopped at a military base, so then we're flying into Baghdad. And the way they did it, it's not safe um, you know, for a US cabinet secretary to drive a motorcade down the street in a war zone. So they land his big military plane, and there's a, like a swarm of helicopters um, that come down one by one so that um, you know, to avoid having too big a target for incoming fire. And even in the green zone, that was a major challenge. So the first Blackhawk touches down, and they whisk him off. It was Bob Gates in this case was Kim off and he goes up and then some of the high-ranking generals and admirals traveling get in the next one and they work their way down the pecking order and the reporters are you know the last <laughs> to sit there on the runway as targets for the incoming incoming mortar fire um, so I'm awaiting the Black Hawk that's going to take the press corps and my phone rang and it was the school nurse back in Washington telling me that my son is sick my then four-year-old son is sick, and um, where am I? How quickly can I get there? 
<laughs> like, yeah, um, not quickly. Day after tomorrow, maybe, best case scenario. Um, and she starts yelling and says, I don't mean to bring him home. I mean, he's really sick. He's struggling to breathe. We need to get him to a doctor or maybe the hospital. Like, where are you? And uh, I'm trying to figure out what the, what the answer is and you know what the time zone is and where the babysitter is and how I can deal with this. And I have to get in this helicopter. <laughs> and we lose cell phone signal as we take off. And I lost the line and was not able to connect get a connection to work for hours. And uh, I just remember sitting in a Blackhawk looking down and the traffic was all snarled beneath me in Baghdad and thinking, what am I doing? Mm. I love my job and I worked really hard to get here and I'm good at it. Um, but I have a four-year-old who may or may not be breathing and he's thousands of miles away and what am I doing? And they, I know, they assigned us to sleep that night um, in these military trailers that they had set up um, behind one of Saddam Hussein's old ab abandoned palaces. And I remember climbing into my bunk bed and just crying and thinking, okay, maybe it's time for career plan B, at mm. least for now. And on the way back, on the flight back, back to Andrews, um, I started writing what became my first book because I was trying to figure out how to do work that would feel meaningful, um, but not be on a helicopter the next time that call came in. Yeah. And you did leave the job I not did. long I after quit. that. I quit. I flat out quit that time and uh, didn't ask them to hold a beat and was away from the newsroom for several years mm. and wrote a couple of books and loved it um, and was very present for my children. And then they got a few years older and they seemed healthy and they seemed happy and they were thriving in school and I never stopped missing the newsroom um, and the uh, I guess it's the straw that broke the camel's back for me was um, the Paris terror attacks which were 2015 and they were awful as you may remember and as I was following the coverage you know, from home um, not in the newsroom I felt that normal human reaction of horror at what had happened and also an impulse that I suspect is unique to journalists and first responders, which is I need to go. Mm -hmm. Like, put me on a plane. I need to get there. I need to get there. I had done a lot of counterterrorism reporting in Europe, and I speak French, and I know Paris well, and I just thought, I need to be on the plane. I need to go. And I thought, if I'm still having this reaction um, after several years out, I probably need to go back. And I called my editors and said, how about it? And I went back to NPR at the very beginning, early January of 2016, which turned out not to be a quiet news year to <laughs> go back. <laughs> it was that presidential I mean, election, as I recall. It hasn't really calmed down since, no. <laughs> um, we all know the African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. Who was your village? Gosh, so many people. Hard to know where to begin to thank them. Um, I will say my mother my sainted mother, who um, lives in Georgia. And last year when I you know, got a call, it looked like war was about to come in Ukraine, and I was being asked, can you get on a plane, like, now? Yeah. We need you there now. And I called my mom, and she said, OK. And she coordinated her flight so that she was landing the same day that I was heading out um, so she could help me hold down the fort. She is at my house right now so that I can do this book tour, um, holding down the fort with uh, Alexander, who's now 17, and a rambunctious Bernadoodle, and um, making sure that dinner gets on the table yeah. and the lights are on and the house is all right. So I would start there. Um, I have... I have a phenomenal network of female friends mm -hmm. um, who I talk about in the book because they have been so critical to the way I've navigated my career and my family. Um, and one of the transitions moving from being, in my case at least, a reporter where you are working with an editor but pretty much on your own. Like you decide what stories you want to do. You go do the interviews by yourself. You travel the world by yourself. Um, to working as a, an anchor, a host, 
has been the transition to working with a huge team and in a way that uh, every assignment I touch, there's many people on it. Um, at my book event, when this book published on Tuesday in Washington, um, some of the producers, four or five of the producers who have been with me in Iran, in North Korea, in Ukraine, um, it, just all over the world came, and it meant the world because they, um, they have had my back and held me up and allowed me to, you know, as I've made my way through my career, be much more assertive about carving out boundaries and, and holding mm -hmm. certain blocks of time and saying, I'm just not available. I don't care what interview comes through. I gotta be home in that window. Mm -hmm. um, and you need a team that supports that, and mine has. So you mentioned your mom, and there is a beautiful passage about her in the book that I would love for you to share with us, if you oh, don't sure. mind. Um, and it's about uh, your trip to Ukraine. Okay, and let's see. Um, ah, okay, so this is, um, this is a passage from the trip to Ukraine, right, um, this was late January, early February, so right before the invasion last year, and... Um, my team and I had gone in, we'd been in Kyiv, and then we decided to go into Donbass and get up as far against the, uh, the front lines and, and the border with Russia as we could. So this is us um, journeying. Right before we board the sleeper train west, back toward Kyiv, and the interviews that await us there the next morning, a text arrives from mom. I know that she is writing because she's worried. She wants to make sure that I am safe, that I haven't lost my coat again, that I'm on my way back to the relative safety of the capital. She writes, none of this. I made a huge pot of spaghetti sauce, she reports. There's some in the freezer for the boys on another day. It's very cold here. The snow hasn't melted. Shadow, the Bernadoodle, and Nick are watching TV together. We miss you, but we're doing okay. I read between the lines. I have been corresponding with my mother for a lifetime. Um, and in what might seem a simple status update, I detect several subtexts. Yes, this is a gentle nudge to check in. It is also a quiet assertion of competence. She would like for me to know that she is doing splendidly, that she is running my house with a grace and efficiency from which both I and the military commanders on the front lines that I have just left behind might learn much. But what I also read, and maybe I'm just saying what I need to see, is encouragement and permission. You have chosen such a different life than I did, she's writing. Go live it, go do your thing. James and Alexander are fine, they are happy, their bellies are full of spaghetti. I've got this, you are free to go get them. A mother's love is such a powerful force. It can wear courage, across thousands of miles, straight into a war zone. If you are very lucky, it can score you a Bernadoodle or a guinea pig. It's another story. Mm -hmm. That night, I lie on my narrow berth in the tiny compartment I'm sharing with my producer, swaying as the train wheels rumble underneath. Strange towns whip past in the dark. I close my eyes and try to sleep. I'm thinking of all the people we have met on this trip of how they have trusted us with their stories, of how to write my report tomorrow in a way that is true and fair and does them justice. And I am thinking of my mother and how we pay it forward. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I want to talk about that guinea pig in just a moment, but I want to ask you about a different interview before we get to that. Um, you write in the book that there are three principles that you have been teaching your sons as they were growing up. Um, never give up. You can only control your own actions, and sometimes you have to stand up to bullies. Um, you also share those lessons in the context of your viral interview with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and you were talking about U.S. policy in Ukraine and in Iran. And I'm just thinking about when that interview happened, um, after it was over, he called you into his office, he 
cussed you out, he accused you of lying, he asked you to find Ukraine on an unmarked map, and then in the time following that, um, former President Trump and Alan Dershowitz and others kind of piled on with all of that, and it felt um, highly undiplomatic coming from the chief diplomat in the United States, but for a lot of people it also felt misogynistic. And if you, if you would allow us to eavesdrop around your kitchen table a little bit, how did you talk about that with your sons at that time? Um, so I'll preface everything I say with saying I, um, it was a fascinating interview. I'm glad we did it. I believe the journalism speaks for itself and I bear Mike Pompeo no ill will. I wish him well. Um, it was a surreal experience um, because my children are used to me reporting the news, not being in the news. And yeah, to come home to the dinner table and explain that the President of the United States at the White House has just publicly praised his Secretary of State in a meeting with the Prime Minister of Israel and said, you know, great job, Mike. You really did a good job on her. Um, the lovely thing about teenage boys is they, you know, were engaged in that and then the conversation fairly quickly shifted to have you walked the dog and what's for dinner? <laughs> um, so it's a good, <laughs> a good reality check on, on what the real priorities are. Um, but I have now had three years to think on the aftermath of that interview and what I took from it. And... Um, what I hope my boys someday take from it. And I did, it did boil down to those three. The, the never giving up in the context of a big newsmaker interview like that is, you know, expresses itself through, um, you don't give up in questioning somebody. Mike Pompeo really didn't want to be questioned about Ukraine. I had told his team I would be asking questions about Ukraine. And I don't know that there is a, a journalist on this planet who could have interviewed the Secretary of State in that moment and not asked about Ukraine. Um, this was January of 2020 when the United States Senate was in the middle of an impeachment trial of what became the first impeachment trial of Donald Trump, the president, over matters to do with Ukraine. And the people testifying for the most part uh, as witnesses were people who worked for Mike Pompeo, or had worked for Mike Pompeo until they were ousted um, over Ukraine policy. So how can you not ask? Um, he didn't want to be asked about it. He made clear he didn't want to talk about it. He then did talk about it, despite himself. Um, but I go into any interview like that. Not, you know, I, I don't relish confrontation, and I don't ever want to ask what might be seen as a gotcha question, but if I ask a question um, to the most senior American formulating our foreign policy and they don't answer it, I'm going to ask again. Um, and it's not because he owes you know, me any answers, Mary Louise Kelly, but he does, I think, if he accepts an interview request from NPR, he owes our audience some answers. And um, in that case, I felt kind of over my shoulder the presence of um, senior foreign service officers and diplomats who had resigned from the department under his leadership and who were not going to get the opportunity to question him one on one. And I felt like they deserved some answers. And you can disagree or agree with what the answers are, um, but you keep asking. Um, so that was one of them. And the other two that you mentioned about that you can only control your own actions, um, that kind of informed my decision. I didn't talk about the interview. I didn't give interviews about the interview. There were requests coming in from all over the world for it. Um, and I just thought, let's let the journalism stand. Um, it speaks for itself. People can make up their own minds what they want to think about it. Um, he had put out... Uh, when we decided to report on the map test portion of the interview and the swearing portion of the interview, um, I called the State Department before we did so and asked if they wanted to offer any context um, or additional comment, and they did not. Um, but the next morning, Mike Pompeo put out a statement on State Department letterhead calling me a liar. Mm -hmm. And it was 
is tempting the right word? Yes, it's the honest word. It was tempting mm -hmm. to respond, you know. Somebody takes a swat at you that you feel is unfair and the temptation is to yell back. And I just thought, I don't know that there's anything that prepares you as a reporter for being sworn at and accused of being a liar by the Secretary of State. Um, but the, <laughs> the closest thing I had was being the mom of a toddler. <laughs> and um, you learn that there are some occasions when someone is throwing in an, an unreasonable tantrum where you just don't dignify it with a response. Mm -hmm. Motherhood's good training for a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, another viral interview that you did was with Hannah Hotko, um, a former member of the Ukrainian parliament during your reporting assignment that we talked about. And you made a strong connection with her, one parent to another. Um, and you certainly had all of us cheering for her daughter and the guinea pig. We all remember that story. Um, I guess two things here. One is if you would talk about how being a parent informs your work, and of course, if you've spoken with Hannah and what's going on with the guinea pig. Yeah, <laughs> the guinea pig is fine, that's the headline. Um, Hannah Hopko, just to fill in a tiny bit more, is one of the more impressive, formidable women I have ever interviewed. Um, just a, a complete force, former chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in Ukraine's parliament and one of the original leaders of the Maidan protests for independence back in 2014. And when I met her uh, at the very beginning of the war in Ukraine, she had stepped aside from parliament to what seemed like a lower profile job and I couldn't figure out why because she was so ferocious. And I was asking her, you know, did you, I don't know, lose confidence in your ability to change the system from the inside or what was it? And she was like, no, 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 I just, I never saw my daughter. I miss my daughter. Mom, I was on the road constantly for Parliament, and I never saw her, and I love my daughter, and she's 11. And what's really stressing me out, and this is, okay, like two weeks before Russia invaded, and you could see tanks and troops lined up on the border, and everyone we interviewed in Ukraine was packing go bags and figuring out their evacuation plans, and Hannah Hope goes like, the thing that really is stressing me out is my daughter wants a guinea pig, and I promised I would get it for her. But I don't want to have to, like, I don't know how you deal with evacuating a rodent and the cage and the pellets. Like, I mean, it's enough. We'll be, like, running with backpacks. What's this going to look like? And she started crying. She was, this was clearly really stressing her out. She didn't want to break her promise to her daughter. And I start crying. We're in this pizzeria in Kiev, and we're both weeping. And, and I just thought, oh, man, I totally get that. That is what would be stressing me out at this moment. I could handle getting myself, my family out, but a rodent, like it's just a step too far. Um, she did get the rodent. And about a week later, she was texting me pictures of this very cute guinea pig and a very happy looking 11 year old. They did have to evacuate. She got her daughter out uh, with grandparents uh, through Lviv in the West and across mm -hmm. and into Poland. And she stayed and has been fighting for her country. And the guinea pig has been with family friends and has the family's all been separated. Um, I have interviewed her numerous times since then. She has flown to the States a couple of times to meet with now Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, and members of Congress to lobby for, you know, she wants more money, she wants more weapons, she wants more aid to Ukraine. Um, um, but I have interviewed her, I think, maybe five times total. Um, because we did have such a strong connection and I interviewed her, I mean, that was a big portion of the interview and pre-mom me, like 25-year-old Mary Louise Kelly would have thought, what is this crazy woman talking about with this guinea pig? Like, can we get back to NATO and, you know, munitions and what we need to do about sanctions? It just felt like, who cares about some random pet? Um, and the mom in me is like, that's the story. That's the story. If I'm trying to explain to Americans thousands of miles away what the stakes are here, why it matters, how this is impacting people, um, why we should care. This is the story. And every time I talk to her, I get an update on Nafanya, the guinea pig, who's doing all right. Um, <laughs> they have since adopted a puppy whose mom was killed by incoming Russian fire in Donbass. And, um, but 
the puppies survived and they've adopted one and um, still working on getting the family all in the same place as yeah. war there continues. But it's been a remarkable human bond and has affected, we've heard from so many listeners, you know, every time there's some awful development in yeah. Ukraine, and how's the guinea pig, how's Hannah Hopko, how's the daughter? <laughs> to the point yeah. where, just to put a coda on this story, Hannah texted me at one point and it was this link to a butcher's shop in upstate New York. I'm like, what is this? There's no explanation for it. I start looking at the website of this butcher in upstate New York and realize it's this small, artisanal, local, family-run thing, and they have created a sausage made with um, borscht, and it's like a, a borscht and cabbage sausage, um, and they have named it for Hana Hopko and are giving 100% of the proceeds of the sales of the sausage to support Ukrainian refugees. Um, and they'd heard about this story on NPR and wanted her to know, and that had reached Hana Hopko before I heard about it. Um, and I texted with her a little bit, and she said, you know, thank you. It, it helps so much to know that Americans are standing with us in this small way. And I did think about that. I mean, I don't know what the proceeds were for one sausage from a small butcher in upstate New York. It's such a drop in the bucket compared to the needs of Ukraine. But um, the solidarity, the hope that that butcher felt, I'm here I am doing something, what I can from Buffalo, and the hope it gave to Hannah Hopko, who's dealing with the goddamn rodent in Kiev, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get her family back together to know there's some butcher I've never met. Who cares? Yeah. It is taking a stand. Um, those are the stories that matter. Yeah. Well, as they say on All Things Considered, in the time we have left, um, <laughs> a couple of quick questions um, that I'd like to talk about, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for their questions. But I was surprised to learn in reading the book that you have experienced severe hearing loss, probably genetic, you said, which would be challenging for anyone, but I would think for someone who conducts interviews and conversations for a living would be especially challenging. Um, would you be willing to share a little bit about that and how you've been navigating it? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I am um, deaf or pretty close to it, and I wear hearing aids and anchor all things considered every day with hearing aids in both ears. Um, my hearing loss is severe to profound and it's worse at high frequencies, which um, unfairly makes it harder for me to hear women's voices than men, mm -hmm. because higher pitch. Um, I am 52, I just turned 52, and I got hearing aids about a decade ago when it sounded, so just, I had noticed that everyone mumbled all the time. Y'all are really annoying, you all mumble <laughs> all the time. Um, I had noticed I was watching TV with the subtitles on. Mm -hmm. um, but hearing is a funny thing. It's not like vision where you put glasses on and you can see. If you and I, you know, we're in a car and we're driving past, you can read the billboard. I can't. That's pretty obvious. I should probably go get my eyes checked. With hearing, I can hear, I can hear the test they give you at the annual physical, the, you know, raise your mm -hmm. hand if you hear the beep. I can hear the beep. Um, what I cannot do is distinguish between consonants. So um, if you offer me you know, a, a cut of water, a cub of water, uh -huh. I, can't, I, I feel like I can hear the difference because I'm saying those words, but it's only through context that I know you're mm -hmm. offering me a cup of water. Um, and my brain has to really work on, through context and reading lips, um, distinguishing what you're saying. So I um, got hearing aids um, yeah, about 10 years ago. It has been life-changing. Um, I would encourage anyone who hasn't done just, it takes an hour at a, at a real audiologist just to get a baseline of where your hearing is because um, my audiologist swears that probably everyone around the age you need reading glasses would benefit from them. And they're invisible now. And they Bluetooth yeah. and everyone walks around with their earbuds in anyway, so right. like, why not? Um, and it has been life-changing for me and has allowed me to carry on doing work that, that I love and would not otherwise be able to do. Yeah, and it's an opportunity to um, reduce stigma around it because we were talking backstage about how, you know, you need glasses, nobody thinks twice about that, but people are hesitant 
when it comes to hearing aids. Yeah, you think it's like for really old people. And at the time, <laughs> I was 40, 41, and thought, yeah. how, can I, how can I need this? How, yeah. you know? I was, um, it was actually in a book talk with my first book was when it became undeniable because we were in a setting like this and people were asking questions and it became apparent everyone else can hear the question and I can't. And it was so humiliating and in a taxi like on the way home from one particularly difficult event, I just thought, enough, I'm gonna go, I need to go figure this out. Um, and I was, I think, embarrassed for about two weeks I wouldn't wear my hair back because you can, you know, see it when my hair is pulled back. And then I thought, oh, who cares? Right. Whatever. <laughs> Let's get on with it. Yeah. Um, Want to circle back to James, um, your older son, um, just to kind of get an update. So he is now finishing his freshman year. Yeah, in we college. made it. So how did it go so far? He is really happy. So this is the James, the one-year-old soccer player, with the graduated to the high school. Starting striker with the four o'clock games, he finished high school a uh, little less than a year ago and has gone off to the University of Chicago and is loving it, absolutely loving it. So there's a happy ending to that part of the story and I am gonna get to see him on book tour next week where we have a stop in Chicago. And now I'm about to live like, I guess, the real year of no do-overs because his little brother Alexander is a junior year in junior year in high school, um, also plays striker on the, <laughs> the varsity <laughs> soccer team. So I haven't quite figured out what the fall season is gonna look like. Um, don't tell my editors because I have not opened that conversation yet, <laughs> but I'm gonna be trying to figure out how I can take some time yeah. to, um, to show up yeah. and be there and be present. Um, I would be remiss before we go to our audience if I didn't ask you um, the most important, probably the toughest question of all, which is, what's it like to have a chicken named after you? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, it's wonderful to have a chicken <laughs> named after you. I highly recommend it. I, um, I don't have anyone named after me because I have two boys and I didn't pass on any of my names and I was cogitating on that. And in the weirdest, I mean, I don't know that there's a normal way to find out that you have a chicken named after you, but um, we had done a story on a refugee crisis on the Belarus-Polish border, and I tweeted it out to try to call attention to this humanitarian disaster that was unfolding, and um, the very first reply back was from a stranger saying, Something like, you know, dear lady journalist, I have named a chicken for you. I was like, you named a chicken for me? And she sent a picture of Mary Louise Clucky, who, who shares a coop with, what was it? Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and oh, nice. um, Sonia Sotomayor Mayover Easy, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea what I did to deserve this honor, um, but. Uh, this is a chicken in, I believe, Kansas City, who is named for me uh, by clearly a loyal NPR listener, and I am immensely grateful and actually was really touched by it to the extent that I <laughs> And you were in lofty book, company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I love listening to you. I look forward to it every day, and I'm a big fan. Um, what do you think about NPR and Twitter? Mm -hmm. NPR and Twitter, mm -hmm. is that the question? Um, for those who don't know, uh, the news story of the week is that earlier this week, NPR announced that we are stepping away from Twitter, uh, that all of our official accounts will go silent. Um, and this is in reaction to Elon Musk first um, labeling and putting a badge on our account, on our main account, labeling us as um, state affiliated state-sponsored media, which is um, you know, the label that's affixed to RT in Russia and other you know, um, media in, in uh, authoritarian states. It was changed this week to, I believe it's now government-sponsored media, and that label has been applied to NPR and PBS and the BBC and leading public broadcasters. Um, it, again, I don't, I'm not speaking for NPR here, but I will speak for myself and say the label is, is wrong. It should be removed. Um, NPR gets 
less than 1% of our funding through grants available through the CPB, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Um, most of our money comes from private foundations mm -hmm. and you know, from all of you. <laughs> I know that our pledge drives are really annoying, but they really matter. <laughs> that it is vital that money comes into our member stations who support us. So you know, we answer to all of you. Um, not to the government. I, have, I hand over heart, there's just absolutely no inkling of government influence, control. I don't even know how that would manifest itself. And it's problematic because it, um, it is a false label on everything that NPR was tweeting. It puts my colleagues who are in places like Russia and Iran, other places, in danger. Um, and so NPR has decided to go dark. Uh, PBS followed suit yesterday. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, individual journalists, including myself, are for now. Um, I'm staying on the platform because it remains a place where I am getting information that I can't get from mm. other places. For example, if there's news breaking somewhere um, that's hard to get to and we need to talk to someone there to put them on the air to find out what's happening, one of the most common things we do is geolocate. You know, who's tweeting from where? Are they tweeting in English? That would be even better. Can we get them on the phone? Go. And we find people there all the time, um, trying to follow what's happening in Iran, a country I was in reporting from earlier this year. Um, there is no other platform that rivals it um, for reach for now. Um, but I think we're all changing the way we think about it and the way we will operate and it's a really unfortunate situation that I hope um, that I hope will change. You write such a uh, personal book. Has, uh, did you give your son any veto power, James? Say that again, I couldn't. Did you, did you give your son any power, any veto power over oh. what you wrote about <laughs> Absolutely, <in> <laughs> great question, <laughs> yes. Um, my sons both read you know, every chapter in which they feature prominently. And it um, was great, they helped me fact check. Sometimes they had different memories of things or remembered <laughs> something I hadn't and it prompted some interesting conversations. But yes, I said to them early on, you have veto power. If there's anything in here um, that you don't want, it's gone um, because it's not worth it to me. There was only, in the end, they didn't veto anything. Um, there was one, <laughs> There was one story that James had to kind of think about, which was that um, it was a phone call that I got when I was in Atlanta, in Georgia, visiting with my brother and mom and family who lived there on a Sunday morning, and James called me from Washington asking, can you move dad's car? <laughs> um, this is our driveway in Washington is long enough that if you scrunch them, you can fit three cars, but it's tandem. So whoever's pulled in first is then blocked and we're constantly you know, doing a dance of rearranging the car. So he's calling me on a Sunday morning saying, can you move dad's car? And I, and I said, I, no, James, I can't. He said, mom, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, have, I have SAT prep. I gotta go right now. Why can't you move dad's car? And I said, James, I can't move dad's car because I'm in Georgia, not Washington, and have been for four days. Did you, <laughs> did you not notice that I haven't been, I mean, there aren't that many people living in our house. I would notice if one of you just disappeared for a long weekend. <laughs> Silence, then he said, fine, I'll, I'll ask dad. And hung up, and I thought, Okay, for starters, if, it, if your father's car was the problem, why, why weren't you asking your father in the first place to move the car? But secondly, um, did you really not miss me at all? You know, <laughs> this child who was once utterly dependent on me for food and warmth and life itself, and you didn't even notice that I hadn't been home. Um, so he read that and said, God, I look like such a jerk, don't I? And I said, no, I think, I think it's actually kind of funny, and it's, you know, Again, it's the goal. I want you to be independent and making yeah. your own breakfast, and you know, yeah. it's okay. So he, he thought about it and then said, okay, it can stand. And also, moms are the default for everything. Moms are the default for everything. So. That's why we get the phone calls, whether it's to move the car or from the nurse in Baghdad or whatever it is, moms are the Moms default. get the first call. Yeah. Hi. Um, how do you handle the terrible mass shootings that occur weekly? 
Um, mm. Same same scene, different city. I'm sure it affects you. Yeah. Um, it is a challenge when you find yourself covering the same story over and over to the point where the fact that you're having to do it over and over breaks your heart and is part of the story. Why do we keep having to do this over and over? Um, we have tried different approaches. Um, you know, there's always, there is always something different because it's a different community. If it's a different place, it's different people. Um, we try, you know, with all of them, um, to focus on the victims, the people, the families, the community. We read their names. Um, there's some, you know, I remember the Las Vegas shooting was 70 something people and I, I went to Vegas to cover that. And um, it takes a long time to read that many names, but it matters. And it recenters what the story is. Um, um, you cover the facts every time. Um, it is horrifying and true that sometimes that script at this point can write itself in my head. Mm. What did the cops say? What do we know? Was there a motive? What do we, you know, did this person have anything that should have triggered some kind of, you know, if there are red flag laws or whatever it is? Um, was there anything that might have pointed to this person? Um, and I don't know that there's a great answer other than that we will continue to cover it. We'll continue to try to do so fairly. We'll continue to try to put tough questions to people on all sides of this. And, um, and to do it in ways that you know, capture the humanity and what the stakes are and don't put the shooter and whatever their misguided mission was. Um, but it's hard. And so those are some of the hardest interviews I do because I'm not the story. Um, but I don't feel neutral about those stories. And um, how could you? You're human. And trying to ask questions in a way that still bears witness, um, that is fair, that is open-minded, where you're listening about something that is, should just sway your heart, is hard. We do our best. Hi. Hi. Knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently? And what advice would you give to a working mom mm -hmm. of a young toddler? <laughs> I. It's a great question because I know I've spent my whole career on being a mom wrestling with this stuff. I spent a year really wrestling with it and trying to capture it in a book. I wish I could tell you I have some, I have the answer that I've climbed the mountain and you know, the heavens <laughs> parted and revealed the, the way to have it all and have it all at once. Um, they didn't, I'm sorry to report. I do, I think about the way I approach journalism um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's, you know, there are people who are phenomenal op-ed writers and put their views out there. There are people who are great, you know, opining on cable TV news. I feel like I'm way better at asking questions than answering them. This is a weird <laughs> dynamic. I, I'm like fighting the impulse to say, well, how do you do it? What do you think about that? Um, and I know, to your question, I, I, I don't have an answer on that, but I am willing to wrestle with it and give you, you know, as honest and unflinching a glimpse into how I've come at this as I can. And this book is kind of an attempt to apply that approach to journalism to my personal life. Um, I will say, and I speak only for myself here, I have in my, in my own case found I can't have it all and all at once. It just doesn't happen. Um, and I have, over the 19 years that I have been a journalist and a mom, done every permutation of all in, full time, flat out, constantly in the newsroom, or 
completely not working outside the home or working a four day week or you know trying to do flexible hours or at the moment I work a very intense full time job but I'm pretty hardcore in a way that I wasn't even a decade ago about setting boundaries. I mean a little example of that is when my kids were small and they had an orthodontist appointment or a pediatrician appointment. I was so worried about being mommy tracked or seen as less ambitious or hardworking than somebody else that I would do the appointment, but I would kind of tell my bosses, I, you know, I'll be a couple hours late because there's a doctor's appointment. I'm not really saying who had the doctor's appointment. And now I'm we have a, you know, there's a calendar where I've got my personal appointments, but there's a main calendar that dozens of people, producers and editors, can see as they're booking my interviews and travel. And I'll block time off on there, and it's, you know, Alexander to the orthodontist, and I am not available, and I will call in when I'm done. And I do that in a public way, partly, I think mainly, because I want my younger colleagues coming up to see this is okay. This is okay. And I want to see the men putting that stuff on the calendar too. Like, we need to all be doing that and it's the only way that these jobs are sustainable, that, that like any job is sustainable. I realize I'm lucky to be in a position of seniority where I can do that and I get that there are jobs where you can. But little things like that have helped me manage my stress about just saying this is my boundary and I'm just not available for certain times. Um, and modeling that to the extent that it's possible within my work. Um, so I try to make little changes like that and um, prioritize what needs to be prioritized. In an attempt to keep you on the stage, I have a really difficult question. Um, <clears throat> and that is, when we talk about the fourth estate, we, most of us, I think, think of it as a safeguard over our democracy long term. But it has evolved into something else. It's, it's kind of become part of the extreme partisanship mm -hmm. that our country so suffers from. You're talking about the media? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. So my impossible question is, how do we get back to a place where it's serving the role that it, I think, once served and can it ever again? Yeah, that's gonna keep me up here for a while, so I hope <laughs> y'all don't have any plans for sleeping tonight. Um, I don't know that we go back to where we were. I just don't know that that's gonna happen. Um, the media landscape, like so much else in our lives, is so fragmented now. Um, you know, that era where we all got our news from Walter Cronkite was gone generations ago, decades ago. Um, the echo chambers are real. It's part of why I, for now, am on Twitter. Um, I want to be exposed to people who think really differently about the world, even if they're trolling me. <laughs> like, you know, if it's possible to engage in a conversation, I want to be there. And some of the alternate platforms, I see a lot of my friends, and they're, you know, we're all, it's much more pleasant, but I don't want to be somewhere where everyone agrees. Um, so I don't know that we're going back to where we were. And I really feel it. Um, the, the mistrust of the media is real, and I think some of it is earned. Um, I think we have earned some of it. I think there were, have been real lessons learned um, during these last few years covering the Trump administration, and I say that whatever one's politics, um, and whether you hate him or love him, he says a whole lot of things that are not true, that are lies, and that are destructive for our democracy in that way. And trying to figure out as media organizations, I know that I think we were slow at NPR to sit to call it a lie, um, to not broadcast certain things live, because you can't fact check and provide context live. Um, I anchored our live coverage, was it last week or the week before when he was indicted in Manhattan? And then went back and spoke from Mar-a-Lago. And we did special coverage that night with our reporters in Manhattan and in Florida and analysts and lawyers and legal experts and 
you know, political strategists, all the rest, but we did not carry his remarks live um, because you can't check them in real time. Um, we, you know, aired portions of them and then fact-checked. So we are learning. I find one of the most helpful things we can do and constructive things is being more transparent because we have conversations constantly in the newsroom. How are we gonna cover this? Are we gonna take it live? Are there, you know, how are we describing this? What words do we wanna use? Um, but if we don't share that with all of you, you don't know that we're, we may not be making perfect calls every time, but we're really trying and we are being thoughtful about it. Um, so we did an interview, I interviewed our, uh, it's our managing editor, senior vice president for content and managing editor earlier that week talking about here's how we're going to cover it, here's why, here's why, how we've deployed our resources to cover the indictment, um, here's what kind of things you're going to hear and not hear on NPR. And we put that interview on air and there was some conversation over is that kind of navel gazing and maybe it is. But I felt like it was important just to, yeah, like pull back the curtain and let you see we're trying. This is the way we're fact checking. This is the way we're approaching, whether it's that story or the gun debate or abortion or anything else, um, letting people glimpse a little how the decision making gets done. And then you can agree or disagree with the way we're doing it, but at least you know um, what the editorial framework is for how we're covering things. And I wish more news organizations did that and let you glimpse a little bit what's going on. The last thing I will say on this that gives me some hope is our democracy has been shaken. And again, whatever your politics, um, what happened on January 6th should make you sit up <laughs> and take notice. And our institutions held our courts held, we know what happened because journalists were there and reported it and our First Amendment and our Constitution protected our right to do so. That is not the case in a lot of countries that I have reported from. And um, I anchored our live coverage that day and we told you and we're figuring out as best we could along with the rest of you what was happening and you heard us doing it in real time um, and then coming back to it every day and still trying to piece together what happened, why, what does that mean for our democracy. But our institutions held, the media worked. Um, and that gives me some hope. Well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mary Louise Kelly for being with us tonight.